And if the end game is to have a nice deep bell curve, there's going to be cost to districts that, that follow it in the the law, and you're going to have to require new staffing on the other things. And so it's valuations on bell curves. I'll say that this is probably one of the biggest unfunded mandates that we have, we have ever seen. I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows what this is going to cost. This is the community. How does, it, how does the small district, I'm sorry, the big rest of the world, a fire island or a shelter island, this is a this and they only have one building, have one principal as a superintendent. They, they, well, they already do that. They contract for both these. Uh, you know, these well, Mauritius is principal and superintendent. So the superintendent usually does principal evaluation. can't do it because it's himself. So we contract somebody from both these. And if Tisha's word is truth that if they're a high functioning school, they won't have to abide by the same yeah, okay. I don't think she ran it by the government. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay, the second part of this is teacher and principal tenure uh, and discipline. Um, the tenure laws have changed, and uh, the probationary period for teachers has now been extended from three years to four. And we hire after July 1st, 2000. And the, uh, the teacher must earn an effective or highly effective uh, in three of the four years. Can I go back and ask a question about the tenure? What happens if it's a teacher from another district that comes from the most important district and teaches now? Is that considered even higher? So they have to look at the four years. It used to be two years. Right. I think now that goes to three years. Three years. years. If they previously had tenure here, it goes to that three goes to three years. years. <coughs> so, um, in, ex in continuing with that, educators who earn ineffective rating during the fourth year may not be offered tenure, but may be offered an additional probationary year. Teachers and principals earning two consecutive ineffective ratings may be brought up on charges of incompetence by school districts. If the individuals receive three consecutive ineffective ratings, they must be brought up on charges of incompetence. And during that time, it's a 3020A, it's a and when they would be paid to during the proceedings, right? I don't think that, that is that was a, I don't know. <coughs> I, I don't think it won't be paid during the 3020A. I got <coughs> certain parts of the 3020A, but not going to be paid. I don't know. I, I, I think they weren't paid. Do you have information on that? Or? Well, charges, I guess, are depends. Depends on the charge. I don't know that the information. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more details that are going to follow. Um, this is just a very, very brief outline of <coughs> what some of the issues um, Another issue uh, in the war is referred to as receivership. And, and um, nonetheless, it's still something to consider. Persistently failing schools is defined persistently failing as 10 years of low performance. They have one year to implement a state-approved comprehensive educational plan that includes rigorous metrics and goals. And then if you're a failing school where your performance is in the lowest 5% of the schools for three consecutive years, you have two years to implement a state-approved comprehensive educational plan. When when the one or two year periods expire, SED is responsible to conduct performance review of the school. And if no improvement is made during that time period, the state assigns a receiver who will be appointed for a period of no more than three years to manage and operate all aspects of the schools. That's teaching, principals, everything. Hiring, salary, Hiring, that's everything. everything. And develop and implement the school improvement plan. I guess as, a, as an aside that they went to three years because I guess what they did in some of the other districts in Nassau County where the state never got out of there, um, I guess they had trouble turning the schools around. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and the, last, the last piece is teacher and administrator certification. And those individuals with a lifetime certification, they must register with the state every five years and they must complete 100 hours of continuing education or professional development within that five-year period. Who pays for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah. 
How much we do now? Teachers, right? teachers, right? teachers and administrators. District, yeah, we, have, we don't have clarification. Right? The district has to offer that. Or teachers <coughs> have to do We don't have clarification. Right? <coughs> it's usually up to the individual to get their professional development. How it's offered is always. Yes. With, with the post-2004 people, which was 175 hours a week, right. uh, it was up to the district to offer. Right. So, and that could be a faculty meeting. That's correct. A whole bunch of with this one, I read a lot of these notes, not clear. With this, it seems to put more of the onus on the individual teacher. So, by getting another master's of sense of Maybe the governor is going to be offering classes. <laughs> well, also, what, what, what do you have to do to be a governor? What's the criteria for that? <laughs> you have to have 150 hours of yeah. <laughs> You know, if you go with the receivership, you know, that's essentially what that is. The way I see that is a, an open door, an open window for charter schools to, to take over public education. It's, it's very clear what, they, what their intent is in, with, with that. Yeah. And like Walt said, uh, you know, we, we hope that never happens to us because if that receiver, quote unquote, comes in, <coughs> they, they run the ship. If this community is in the bottom 5% of the state, we deserve it. Yeah. Right. Okay, so after all that, after all that good news, uh, we fi finally get to where we are. And just as a uh, as a recap, when we left off, when we first started the budget process, uh, we were at an 89.1 million dollar budget. It was a spending decrease of 1.05 percent, and a projected increase on the tax rate of 2.14. Um, with the additional monies and those things that we discussed with the board that we were uh, going to restore, uh, we came up with a revised draft two budget. That's an 89.3 million dollar budget, just under 89.4. Um, still represents a decrease in spending, 0.72 percent. And we also applied some of the funds to bring down the proposed tax rate to 1.76 percent. And as we go along, you'll see more on the details in each one of those areas. Um, this is basically an updated uh, revenue schedule and tax rate schedule. You'll see on the top line that the additional state aid that we're applying to the budget is just under $1.2 million, which is about a 5% increase in aid. Um, you'll notice that our other income, which is the miscellaneous categories and in income, we're down overall about $192,000 uh, for various adjustments, pluses and minuses. And um, moving along to our uh, applied fund balance and reserves, you'll see that uh, we brought some of those figures down as well. And we're proposing using $3,347,000 from reserves and fund balance to fund the portion of the 1516 budget. Um, which brings us to our property tax levy. You see the increase of 1.76% and the spending decrease of 0.72% actually represents a monetary dollar amount of decrease of $652,000. Um, if you follow the balancing wall, the property levy cap formula, which I probably have changed four or five times already since we filed it back in February as the numbers keep changing. Um, you may recall that our property <coughs> started out, it was relatively low, somewhere around the 2% mark. Um, as we received our new state aid figures and our building aid figures, since we're getting less building aid, it actually drives up our cap percentage. So the calculation of our property tax cap is now 2.7%. Uh, keep in mind that we are draft two, we are projecting a 1.76% tax increase. So therefore, we're about almost a full percentage point under the calculated cap, which is, I think, a very, very good thing. In looking at the expenditures and the effect that that has had on the, uh, on the overall budget by category, you can see that our salaries and fringe benefits still have an overall decrease of about 1.37%. Our uh, debt service is still a decrease of 
Um, our contractual expenses are relatively stable at the, just over 1%. Our BOCES expenditures are still a decrease of 2.9%. And our uh, other expense categories are relatively small, as you see. Um, again, the bottom line is a decrease in spending of 0.72% or $652,000. Uh, just to talk about briefly some of the program restorations and enhancements and some of the changes that were made to draft two of the budget. Uh, we did add one FTE to meet the new ENL, and in parentheses I like to do ESL and ELL regulations, and that's something that Dr. Stimmel will be talking about briefly. Um, John, making the that's part of the 154? Part of the 154 mm -hmm. regulations. That's yes. correct. Uh, we also added one elementary teacher to lower class sizes um, and also restored the varsity assistant coaches, um, as we had discussed. Uh, we implemented a BOCES run summer school program at Sable High School, and we have uh, several additions to staffing that basically round out and enhance our programs. A sixth grade guidance counselor at the middle school. Uh, we added a 0.6 FTE to uh, have full-time librarian, me library media specialists at each one of our elementary schools. And we are proposing the addition of a fencing team, both boys and girls, and continuing with the one-on-one -on -one Chromebook uh, program for grades 8, 9, and 10 next year. Some of the new courses that are being uh, offered next year are Year 2 of AP Physics, uh, Historical Research, Production Design. With production Design, by the way, there's a second part of that that's uh, based on 3D printing. So you're designing and you're doing 3D printing. Okay. Introduction that's to Computer Programming. Marketing. That's your coding. Marketing and Advertising. Which is what? Computer Programming. Virtual Enterprise. Uh, Can you go back to uh, the coding? What grade level should that be? That's 9 through 12. Regents Geometry with Lab. Model UN, Model Congress, and Independent Study. What is that? <coughs> That's uh, the ability for students to partake in, in Model UN and Model Congress in an independent study format. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Everything here is just high school other than uh, four of the club, which is at the middle school. And basically just a breakout of the course in the various areas that we um, that we modified draft two budget. Uh, you'll see that the total uh, budget changes were just under $300,000. That's program costs as well as benefits. Uh, one of the things that you will note is that we looked at our uh, transportation uh, lines as well in the budget, and because CPI was actually negative last month, we felt that we could reduce that projection. We originally had 2% in the budget, we brought it down to one. Uh, so we took some monies out of the budget and the transportation lines as well. And um, Did the board put back the boys, JV assistant, the lacrosse coach. Uh, if, if you look, there's both the boys and girls, JV assistant, lacrosse coach. Because even though uh, some of the parents thought that uh, lacrosse is different classification between boys and girls. According to Section 11 in New York State's Athletic Association, uh, girls and boys lacrosse are the same classification, and as well as field hockey, soccer, and uh, several other uh, what they call contact sports. So they were incorrect. So if we're going to have a JV boys lacrosse coach, uh, I felt it necessary to have a JV girls lacrosse coach. Thank you. And 
end, I believe that basically summarizes where we are in draft two and the budget process. Just a reminder for the board that we have to, uh, we will be bringing a, a budget resolution at the next meeting for the board to adopt the budget that we will present on May 19th. Maybe before Q&A, John, you can do yours. Okay, so uh, w one of the uh, things that uh, recently had an impact on our budget uh, were changes in the commi Commissioner's Regulations, uh, Part 154, the requirements for the education of English language learners. So I'd like to present this uh, brief overview. Uh, <clears throat> I, I can go into more depth at a later date, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what's happening in the regulation and where we are in SAMO. So the uh, part 154 establishes the legal requirements for the education of English, English language learners in New York State. What happens, the federal government establishes policy, they push it out to the states, <clears throat> the state education departments look it over, they, they make changes, they can't reduce it, but they can <coughs> enhance it. Uh, our, uh, our state amended the commissioner's regulations in September of 2014. The rationale or purpose is to better serve the student, students uh, who, by reason of foreign birth or ancestry, have limited English proficiency. Now, in our state, there's a tale of two districts. Uh, Sayville, we have a very small population. Our, our students who uh, require these services are less than 5%. Of course, there's other districts right here on Long Island where that percentage is much higher, uh, upwards to 50%. So the impact is going to be very different depending <coughs> on uh, what type of district uh, the students attend. Uh, and, and the, the real uh, rationale uh, behind uh, providing specialized instruction for English language learners is that uh, the, it's based on the premise that uh, students will be more effective learners if they receive explicit language, uh, explicit instruction in both language and curriculum. So uh, you notice at the bottom line uh, of the line there it says bilingual education. Uh, because of our low numbers, we will not be required to offer by uh, bilingual education. But in, in the districts where there's a larger, larger percentage of the population, if you have 20 or more students speaking uh, the, uh, a language on the same grade level, you will be required to offer bilingual. But obviously, it's the same, same grade level at, across the district, or is it same right? Grade you district? would have to move kids into a centralized location if it was across the district, and but. And as per language, too. Yeah, I believe so, yes. But, but it, as you can see by this uh, graphic, uh, uh, the, the middle, uh, uh, the graph on the left, the middle column, 2014-15, that's our current school year, we have 15 students receiving uh, English language uh, services. Uh, and you can see they're, they're pretty well spread out. Uh, and what's the primary language? Well, uh, if you look at that graph on the left. I can't see it. That's yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll read it to you. So uh, uh, there's several <coughs> languages spoken by our children, Hindi, Mandarin, Urdu, Pushtu, Spanish, and Chinese. So, so uh, there's no, and they're pretty evenly spread out. Uh, uh, most of our students are on the elementary level, but we do have students scattered throughout our middle school and high school. Uh, the current proficiency levels are advanced, intermediate, and proficient. We have six advanced students, two intermediate students, and seven beginners. Uh, the percent of our popula of our entire population is just under five percent. It's four point nine percent. We have uh, more boys. We have twelve boys and three girls. Uh, the average years in the program uh, right now is two. Uh, because of the nature of our program, we traditionally have not had full-time providers. Uh, because of scheduling issues, we have to fill our, our needs this year with two part-time uh, staff. So we have 1.6 teacher, ESL teacher, and 1.8 ESL teacher. And I apologize. I know sometimes we call them ELL, 
ESL, and the newest term is English as a new language, or Sister Belmondi stole my thunder. Uh, English as a new language is a new term because what, what we're finding is many students are coming to, to our schools where they may speak two or three languages, but English is a new language. For that, it's not a second language, it might be a third or a fourth language. Yes. 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 Are they proficient at their native language? Well, that's a great that's a great observation because that's a real issue. When we have students who come to us, uh, a, a real determinant of how successful they'll be is how proficient they are in their native language. Many students come to uh, uh, America with little or no educational background from their native uh, home. And that, that usually uh, makes it that much more difficult for them. Uh, for the most part, our students uh, were young enough that when they started here, that wasn't, that wasn't an issue. And some of our older students who recently moved in did come from a formal education in their, in their native country. But some communities are not facing, uh, not even proficient in their own native language. And they just, you know, they're the, they're referred to as Sife, there's another term, which I did not include in this because it's not an issue for us, but a Sife is a student with an interrupted formal education, S-I-F-E. Uh, and in some districts, uh, that's a huge issue uh, because there's, there's children, young, young men, young women moving into high school and not having that, and yet the state expects them to be able to graduate. So now, when these, when these non-English language learners coming to what district and they're not proficient in English, what's the time period they have before they have to become, the test to become proficient? Is it a year and a day? Is that the time period? Or is there any time period for that? No, there's not really, uh, uh, you know, as soon as possible, I think is what the state mm -hmm. would say. Tests every year. So they're tested every year. In fact, uh, uh, our ELAs have started and uh, what's referred to as the nicest lots mm -hmm. have started also. So. Uh, are those tests given in the native language, or are they those tests given no, in English? No, in English. So that can skew the result of a of the teacher, rather than the high mix of non-English language learners. Potentially, the yes. Actually, I was just reading up on the <coughs> guidance document. It, 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 at, at what point uh, does it tip the scale? Well, but I guess. But uh, 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 because of, because our population is generally pretty well scattered. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem to be that critical an issue, but it, it, I'm still looking into it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, currently, uh, four of our five schools have students who receive uh, English language services. So uh, what's covered under the Part 154 regulations? I'm not going to read through everything on the left, but uh, as we move forward in the presentation, I will, uh, I will highlight some of the more uh, uh, relevant uh, components. The main components of the change, so there's three main areas. Uh, the identification process, uh, program requirements, and, and uh, I'm going to uh, emphasize the word expanded program requirements. Uh, the, the state has raised the ante. It's requiring more of school districts. So that's, that's your budget impact. And then uh, regulations. Uh, the regulations are changing, and uh, the board will have an opportunity uh, later this school year to review new policy based on these regulations. So, and that policy is 4326. So our current policy, which is in place now, reflects the current <coughs> regulations, and it is effective for the remainder of this school year. Uh, as policy, it's, it's relatively broad. The, the devil is in the details, and so the uh, related school personnel, myself included, have to make sure that we are meeting the regulations. Uh, but updates will include uh, how we uh, provide orientation for our new families, and then uh, ongoing or, uh, orientation, the, what the program's gonna look like, how placement will be conducted, notification. Uh, so th when you have an opportunity to read through the new policy, it will reflect the new, the new regulations, and that will go into effect January, uh, July 1. So uh, here, here are some of the main areas of change. Uh, in the past, uh, there were four levels of proficiency. There are now five. So students are referred to as entering, emerging, transitioning, expanding, and commanding. That's opposed to beginning, intermediate, advanced, and proficient. Uh, 
So, so, but each one of those levels comes with a, a prescription of program. So, so, and that's that's the devil in the details. So, uh, for instance, uh, a beginning student was uh, was always required to have 360 minutes. Now, those 360 minutes are being prescribed. Uh, 180 of the 360 minutes uh, will be, uh, they will receive the services of the English as a New Language teacher or the ELL teacher. One unit of the study has to be integrated within <coughs> an English language arts class. So, so now, if you happen to have uh, on the elementary level a classroom teacher who is duly certified, then that's fine. You, you can place the child in his or her classroom. Since, since there aren't too many duly certified ESL uh, common branch teachers, we are required to have two teachers. There, there will be team teaching. Other program changes are, uh, involve grade span. We used to be able to, uh, like for, for instance, this year we have students who are together uh, first grade through fifth grade. We're no longer allowed to do that. The, the longest grade span is two, two years, so. Which we have a sixth and an eighth grader in middle school. And, and a ninth, ninth and eleventh grader in the high school. So, 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 uh, uh, and, and, uh, four kids, four separate classes. So, uh, and, and the level of service those ch children receive will be determined by how they do on the nicest slide exam, which we will not get the results back until August. So we're kind of scheduling a little bit in the dark. Fortunately, those two folks that I mentioned uh, uh, who are working currently working for us, uh, they, they've done some outstanding work and they are, they're able to project. So I'm going to you know, make, make an educated guess about what our schedule is going to look like. Uh, there's new regulations concerning students with disability, how we communicate with families, what kind of, there's mandatory professional development, uh, the new term English as uh, English new learners, uh, and as I mentioned, staffing, and then there's also regulations pertaining to what kind of credits a high school student will receive who, who uh, attends uh, the English uh, uh, language lessons. So, <coughs> So to kind of wrap this up, uh, what, where do we go next? Well, obviously, I'm working on uh, with the buildings and with staff on scheduling, uh, and I, uh, I advocacy. There's a, uh, <laughs> as I said, there's two two different types of school districts. There's districts like ours that have a relatively low population, and then there's other districts that have a high population. Regardless, the districts need to advocate. We need, we need adequate funding, and we need flexibility with the regulations. Uh, uh, I'm reasonably confident we're going to meet the regulations, but, uh, but it, it, could be, it could be tricky for some of them. Uh, the types of services we offer our students have to be upgraded. Uh, it, there's implications to how we identify our students, how we report, and what kind of accountability we provide the state. state. I mentioned staffing. Uh, we're projecting that our staffing requirements have doubled. So, uh, and we're and but based on we, we could have ten kids move in over the summer, and then we might have we might be in a different situation in September. Uh, policy is changing. You will be receiving a draft of uh, the recommended policy from Garcia and Garcia. Uh, budget, <coughs> Mr. Belmonte has already, you know, presented to you the impact of the budget, and that's included. And then there's issues in terms of teacher certification, and that's something in terms of moving forward when we hire uh, the kinds of qualifications we have to look for in our uh, uh, prospective candidates. Just, just an added thing that's in the budget uh, that's not <coughs> FDB is money for translators because you're required to have parent conference in the parent's preferred language at least one per year and it needs to be documented. So not only do you need a translator, but it will have to be transcript somehow. 
Now, I have a question, uh, John. Students with disabilities, that uh, ENL students, and they have disabilities. So <coughs> there, there, there are, and, and this is, an, this is, this is something where I think the state has used uh, uh, some common sense, mm -hmm. which uh, you don't often hear that. But uh, 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 the the nicest slot, the exam that our English language learners take to determine their level of proficiency, and ultimately when they can exit the program, uh, is a very demanding test. And if you have a student who, who maybe is proficient in English, but is, is learning disabled, that child may fail the nicest slot because of their learning disability, not because of their language proficiency. And so the state has given districts uh, a vehicle for examining that type of situation. And uh, uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a team of the building principal, uh, special ed uh, personnel and uh, school personnel, they review the child's case and then they meet with the parent. And uh, if everyone's in agreement, that child can it, can, it can be determined that that child does not need English language services. So whereas the old regulations, they had to pass the nice slot, which they could take it for, you know, for their entire school career and they might not pass it because of their learning disability. Now, as far as you should translate it at the CSE meeting. No, I, 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 yeah. And I imagine we'll be at the CSD meeting too for the, the special ed. So. Yeah, I think that would be a reasonable one. Yes. Yeah. Is there any type of a screening or certification or process of the translators? Uh, we, we've been to a number of presentations, and uh, so one of the phrases is further guidance is forthcoming uh, that, that we've been told. So, uh, but we, we from a pragmatic point of view, there are agencies that offer translation services over the phone, mm -hmm. uh, where you could uh, uh, arrange a conference call. So, 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 so we're ho we're hopeful that the state accepts that as a as a uh, an effective means of uh, uh, of conducting those kinds of concerns. Concern is confidentiality during the CC <coughs> specialist and the translator there. Well, I think the level of confidentiality would definitely be higher for the CSC. But that's a great question. Yeah. 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 Especially on a, uh, a phone. Yeah, it would have to be somebody who, you know. Right. <coughs> yeah, I think it would be important that that's clear to anybody joining the CSC mm -hmm. that the expectation is that it's a topic meeting. And uh, I'm expecting there uh, be guidance put out from the state to, to help have us. Have we had any situations like that yet? Or? We haven't because it's a, a July 1st initiative. Right. Um, that being said, we have had situations where families have brought other family members or neighbors or friends. And yeah, that's their choice to have their confidentiality. They, yes, they, they're bringing them in themselves. They're not provided by the district. My might may be more concerns for a student having an outsider come in who might not have the same level the, confidentially as me. We make one for that the, student. The phone. Uh, the phone is scared. No, the Sierra phone, we have it at work and uh, we've we'll used it for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the HIPAA was, they're, they're very. I know what's on our side of the phone. I know what's on the other side of the phone. That's in, that's that's where I have. Still have to follow the regulations. Everything is written. Sure. Does the state have a list of people? Because how do we know what their qualifications are? For the translation, yeah. uh, that's kind of, that's one of the things. We, uh, those of us who, like Dr. Sharpness, attended meetings, I've attended meetings, and we, when we pressed on that issue, mm -hmm. we've been told further guidance will be forthcoming. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, Again, the seven files so, are many different languages. So, well, the, the, I, uh, I wanted to be one of the requirements is that uh, written, thing, written documents be provided. We actually have a family whose language has no known written form. So, uh, so, uh, but fortunately, fortunately, we have another family in the district who speaks the language and is able to provide translation service. You know. So, again, the concerns for this, you know, the transcribers and translators for the students' privacy and the family's privacy. Just having an outsider come in and translate, I have 
I'd imagine there will be some confidentiality agreement that needs to be signed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, any questions? Um, fund balance? <coughs> what is the uh, objective uh, on a company of fund balance percent? Um, right now, we're probably at around 3.5%. And, a half and uh, maybe projected at the end of the year, uh, still under 4%. John, you, you mentioned that we're 1% under the levy cap right now, right? Is that the cap point? The cap point, point nine four percent. Now, if we stay at that, is that just to refresh my memory? Going forward next year, can we apply that to the formula as a, a credit, so to speak? Is that uh, how that works? I believe so. We will we will have to run through the formula. I want to get the definitive yeah. answer, but I know it's not a simple formula. Usually, but if you are under a certain percentage, you could carry a certain amount over to the following year. Yeah. In, in addition to uh, the answers that we have with the budget and our proposed tax rate of 1.76, what will it take us to bring that down a little bit more to 1.5? Um, that would take approximately $155,000. Okay, 1.76 would be from and I don't want to I don't want to lose any of our programs for the things we're dated back to this year. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not looking to I'm not looking to take any <coughs> enhancements. I'm just looking to well, bring it down just tax which is down a little bit. More. How are we going to do that without taking this out? It's not a fund balance. It's a, you know we we received a million dollars in GEA. We're not using it all. So we're we're applying some of it to a fund under, balance. We're still under what we're, mm -hmm. we, we're, we always were at 4%, but it's still not there. And that's for maybe next year when we don't get it. <laughs> you know, you have to look at the future. I, mean, well, I am looking at the future. I'm also looking at, yeah. Well, this year we got money. That doesn't mean that we're going to get any next year. And we're, that we're going to get this. You have to look at the history where mm -hmm. this happened. It's, it's I've looked at uh, the history. Yeah, I have looked the at the history. history of what we've gotten in previous years. Been on the books a number of years to look at history where our tax rates are, and I, I think I do have concerns with uh, our, our vote to P, and I, I think a 1.5 is. Oh, I disagree. Okay, maybe about this phrase, I'm not sure. I disagree with you. I think a 1.5 is a better, is a better tax rate. My proposal would just try to bring it down to 1.5. I'm taking that from that. I don't know. The next year, I can come in at 2.5. Then you're going to be everybody's here sitting here is going to be having saying why why can't we we have, don't have enough money in the fund balance? That would have the adverse effect. Of yes. What I just said, right? Yes. If you're taking for less money, less fund balance, and that affects the calculation. A quarter of a percent that I'm taking for taking a chance on the future of our fund with our fund balance. Just a just a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate your opinion. I, I think it's, it's, I mean, next year is, we always have to look forward, and you know, I know our fund balance is important, but also. Yeah. <coughs> I, you know, I, and I would agree, take it into the consideration of the, uh, the, the formula for next year. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's prudent to, to do that, you know, to, to, take, to take a little more from our fund balance. We, then that could be a, a credit for us next year, going forward. All that I ask is that we have a direction for what we need here today. Finalize things for the next Wednesday. Well, I, I share I share my opinion where I you know I, I think the enhancements are great, the additional program for the this one. Uh, uh, sorry, the coach is back and the other things and I would also like to see it possibly drop a little more. That's my opinion. If you share it, you disagree, you may not agree with us. That's how so just to be clear, what you're saying is tip from the fund balance, fund balance to reduce the tax rate this year. Mm -hmm. But there's a risk involved in that, in that next year that goes against our cap formula. And if we were to get less money from the state, that could happen. But I don't know if it's, it's a risk, but it's a risk every year. No, I know. I'm just trying to. Any, just, less, any less, any less any money in fund balance. We already don't have a 4%. Fund like you have Fund like you have less. It's a minimum amount of money. $135,000 in interest. 
Saying is, there's a lot of hidden costs in this budget that was approved, and there are a lot of variables that school districts might have to incur, the costs they might have to incur, given the new APPR regulations with the new observations. So again, and we, and, and we don't want those costs. To come no, we don't. I'm, listen, I'm just making yeah. a recommendation. So I, I just don't feel comfortable trusting them with anything that. No, I agree. So I get the name of the box. Very good. Um, but the equipment, because I recall the last time we went to our $35,000. That was a different type of, um, oh, this is a tractor, I said. What has information, such as some pictures as well. Okay. So um, actually, we found out that recently this contract was just settled. I think the, the price that we projected the budget was around seventy-four. Mm -hmm. I'm not believe somewhere around there. You know, it's probably going to come in five to six thousand dollars less than that. But the rationale was there, Tom, mm -hmm. is to the aging equipment that we have, the acreage that we have to take care of, and um, some of the problems that we run into with the existing equipment aging out and having difficulty getting parts. And that becomes problematic for us, especially during growing season, and especially when we're trying to get the meals ready uh, for our teams. So. Is this the budget? Part of the agenda. Uh, well, we're going to go. Gonna, we're going to have some board discussion now on the budget. That's so we'll, All right. So we'll just take we'll pull up from the board. Okay. <coughs> That's what we're going to do. Right. I had a couple questions. Just uh, looking over the enhancements based on the program, um, I thought there were there were some things that we might want to explore. Um, the fact that our kids are competing in a global global economy, and the fact that. Uh, you know, China is a, is a rising economic power. I thought maybe exploring an elective in Mandarin might be prudent for the district. Um, again, trying to afford every opportunity for our, our students to succeed in the future. Can I talk to sure. you? Whenever you're offering a new language, you need a teacher to certify mm -hmm. that language. That teacher then will be your lowest person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Chances are, in the declining enrollment situation, that person is going to be the first person to go. So you start it, and then you lose it, and then you lose it. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. And, and, yeah. and just, uh, I don't know if the board uh, recalls, uh, we tried uh, for several years to offer uh, uh, an enrichment class through BOCES, <coughs> and it was called the My Chinese 360. Okay. Uh, and uh, we and we funded it, but. Uh, it, 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 we were not able to get any traction. Was it, that, that was, was, that was sending, oh, I was online. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be a lot more attractive having an in-house, I mean, a teacher teach the class. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, the point's well taken, that's going to go up now, but that, that shouldn't 
scare us away from starting new initiatives going around going forward. What about through BOCES program? Uh, through BOCES, do they offer teachers to come um, like they do at the Memorial? Not that I'm aware of. Do they have it? Um, I'd like to direct to John Stimmel. Um, I'd like to thank John. He takes, takes time with me often to, to talk uh, ed policy and, and curriculum in particular. Um, community members and, and teachers have approached me about the math program. Uh, again, I'd like to commend you because I know we are going to, uh, I guess, a K through five. What is it go math or fast math? Right. Uh, it, uh, we, we've been working on our math curriculum. Mm -hmm. Uh, since last year uh, and for the first time uh, in a very long time we actually have a, a math map for K through 6. Uh, our resources for K through 3 are the, the new version of everyday math. Our, our resources for 3 through 5 are is the 2000 uh, it, it's 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 the previous generation. Okay. And then sixth grade, uh, they're, they're, you know, they, they use a variety of resources and then seven through 12 are, it's, it's, there, there's consistency in the, in the approach right now, but there's not consistency in the resources, so. Okay, and we've had some amazing articulation meetings with the buildings, hearing from the middle school teachers, I'm um, hearing from the elementary school teachers, and, and I, I, I learned a lot about math curriculum on the elementary level, and it seems to be that um, it's the mastery concept versus the spiraling concept, and it seems to be two camps that are going back and forth and which one they prefer. Um, with curriculum leadership being re reinstated, um, would it be possible, and what would be the cost moving forward to maybe explore other programs that we might be interested in as far as math on the, on the K-6 or the K-8 level. That's, you know, that ultimately the board decides the curriculum. So uh, uh, I, I will, t the only thing I will say though is, you know, we have, we have numerous teachers, depending on which teachers you ask, no, you're yeah, gonna get exactly, it. Exactly, I got it. And, and, the strategy that I was trying to use was that uh, many times I heard complaints about everyday math. I, and it was usually a generalization. I hate everyday math because. So by doing the mapping, my feeling is shh, point to where the problem is. Because I, I think at the end of the day, it's not going to be, I, and I'm not opposed to looking at new resources, far from it, but at the end of the day, we're st these same issues are going to come and back to us. There's pros and cons. So, so I was trying. What I was trying to do, and still am, is is to uh, uh, refine our our curriculum, our Sayville curriculum, and then once we have that refined, then then approach the argument from a different point of view. Is if this is what we believe is the right curriculum, what's the right resource to get to that concept? And. Uh, and you know, when you think about the tremendous changes go, that, that have been placed on teachers and children, you know, in terms of Common Core, uh, I, I was trying to buy us some breathing room. <laughs> so so uh, uh, certainly moving forward, I'm very excited about the, uh, the possibility of bringing the Curriculum Council back. And uh, I, I think that's a structure that can really help us with that argument. But just so you know, we have math. Our reading program is about 10 years old. Uh, we're uh, the, the next generation of uh, uh, social studies standards have, have the new framework to be released, so we have that issue. Uh, we're still waiting for the, the new science standards. Uh, so we, do, we, I mean, one way is, uh, you know, I, I could pull a, a, a sheet over my head and hide, but uh, another, another way of looking at it is it's a very exciting time to be involved with curriculum. So, uh, uh, yes, I, I, you know, no, I, 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 I really want to choose the, the, you know, the resources that make the right, 
make the most sense for our students. And for now, we're using the strategy. I hope that the map will stay in place and, and then we can kind of turn the argument around and say, what's the resource that, as opposed to, all right, we've got to accept, you, you know, an outsider's approach. Let's, let's look at what's best, what do we believe is best for us. Does that sound okay? You're just saying piloting program. Yeah, I mean, the, the concern was, again, <coughs> no matter what curriculum you have, there's pros and cons. And, and it seemed, you need to distill it down, it seemed to be there was the, the spiraling camp that like yeah. seeing the math concepts returning. And then there was, well, I have kids that really need to master the concepts, you know. So, so it, it, it seemed that basically, you know, some people said, well, can we explore other options, you know? Is that a possibility? Piloting, right. piloting is not a cost to the district, right? I mean, that doesn't work. Yeah. They send you the only thing that, right? Yeah, I think it's well, it's 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 the only thing that I personally think would be necessary in that situation is what we did back when is to have a math facilitator, K5, that was involved that was focused on the elementary schools. You know, I have to say, I've been to board me when my children were little. Math has always been an area at the elementary school that we can't seem to find a program that kind of the teachers and the parents and everybody. And, 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 and there, there, there is kind of a reason for that. What is that? So the, the reform math people believe that, that in the spiraling approach and allowing students the opportunity to discover, if you will, the algorithm. Okay. The traditional approach is you teach one algorithm and, and you teach it to mastery. Okay. Uh, so, and, the, and there's pros and cons to both arguments. Uh, we've tried to split the baby, if you will, in terms of with the mapping. So when, when a particular concept was problematic, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not an everyday math, like, uh, I, I, I don't bleed uh, everyday math, you know, I, 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 I try to be more pragmatic. So there were, there, are, there were problems. The new version has tried to address some of them, but uh, we've tried to tailor the map so that, okay, this is what the student needs to know by here. But uh, some teachers are not comfortable with with an approach that you know you take one pass, you, you, you give them time to explore, then you take another pass. They, they're you know they prefer a more structured approach. It's hard to say sometimes whether one way is right or one way is wrong. However, this I will say, you know, and and I we're not going to have results for this year, I don't think. But uh, uh, the, our results from this year are going to be difficult to interpret. But our our. Test results are typically well above the state average, so in, yeah. in mathematics. So, uh, so we'll come back to it. Okay. It'll be my pleasure. Seems a time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My only last question was just in terms of the website. Um, you know, and, and in the age of transparency and what we went through last year. I <coughs> something that's a little more user friendly is something we might want to consider just to make ease of access and information for the community. Yeah, mm -hmm. No. I think it's just a lot of noise. I no, think. honestly, yeah. just believe it. I know you, you snicker, but I can use it and I'm not there are computer literate, so I thought it thought it was not there. Um consider I guess because you're if you're familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, I guess you can. It's okay. It's a little intimidating. Oh, there's, there's, okay. there's a lot of information on there. It's not necessarily mapped out. You just want to be able to find it. I mean, granted, that, that website is quite a few years old. Yeah, I think that's used to it. And we've been just about it. And I think we're kind of like restricted how we can use it and how we can fix it. I understand it. But I don't necessarily always agree that it was better. Yeah, okay. No, because I mean, there's problems and yeah. there's costs. So it's again, it's just a question I, I wanted to ask. Yeah. I've yeah. gone on other websites and just to find calendars on another school district is sometimes not easy. I think it was nice. I told you, it's also easy. So.
I think you're going to go to uh, board discussion, but I think oh, maybe sorry. we want to, since we're since the board already discussed the budget, I don't know if we want to go to public on, on specifically the budget, go to question and answer period. Sure. The board's okay with that? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, we're going to open a public discussion for, for uh, the budget. If you have a comment or a statement, please uh, step up to the podium. How many people would like to speak tonight so I can see how long we're going to need? Two. Three, four, maybe four people. Let's try to keep the comments to about three minutes, please, and direct your questions to the board chair. I would appreciate it. Uh, gentlemen, one. Good evening, guys. Um, Mr. Belmont, I just had a quick question. One of the slides, there was deductions from budget year over year, but about two thirds down, if I saw it right, I might not have. One line item looked like it went up 60 percent. That was 500,000 to 800,000. I was curious what that was. I couldn't. Uh, that was the. Uh, I think it was that slide. Capital improvement. That was the capital line. Right there. That was the capital line. What we do is we have 800,000 dollars in the budget to begin a five-year program to replace our univents okay. district wide <coughs> and that was one of the things we pulled out of the bond referendum we decided to do it over five years okay. and, um, I mean just as a comment you know looking to get the rate down obviously some people are disagreeing with you um, I mean I'm just curious of the classes that are being added back which have obviously been previously taken away. I was just curious if we had an anticipated or a firm enrollment to bring those classes back. Those, those classes are there, of course, I'm sorry. Well, okay. <laughs> those classes are there because they have enrollment. Okay, so they were heavily, when they were taken away, they were heavily used. You know, we had some classes that aren't running due to lack of enrollment. Right, that's why I'm asking you, you know, if that were not. I mean, obviously, I would hope that we weren't bringing back classes that didn't have, you know, uh, enrollment. So. Okay, and then, I mean, I'm just curious, again, based on the presentation of the, uh, like, what do you call it now, ELL, -L, is that what it was? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Right, so, okay, I mean, just another comment, I mean, from the additional monies received, and obviously the, the money's being put back in to bring classes back, maybe we could have looked at some of that money and said, why don't we throw it over there so we're not all sitting here next year saying, oh, we have to fund this now. Where's that money going to come from? You know, if we end up with more than 15 or 16 children, you know, who need these, you know, need these services. So, I mean, I could be wrong, but and I know that some of the monies didn't go back in for program. Monies went back to, as you pointed out, to reduce the tax rate some, obviously, fund balance again. But, you know, the district did get extra money. So as a taxpayer, we're always looking to see that, you know, the money that goes back in gets used very prudently, and not just like, hey, as people have said, we didn't expect it, we got it. But it's always nice to save some of it, and you know, as well as can, even though times we got extra, we're all, the taxpayer always looking to get the budget down. I mean, you know what? As great as the numbers are, you know, one year to see a zero percent increase would be great too. You know, you know I mean, again, money. There was I mean, what was the amount that came back to us? How much came back that we weren't anticipating this? Well, it was just over a million dollars. Yeah, a million two or so. Yeah. It was about a million and eleven thousand. Okay. So, you know, it's quite a bit of money. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and questions. And we have a question that we just right hand in the back, if I'm not mistaken. No. Okay. Me? Oh. You. We have. All right, thank you. Sorry, I wanted so everybody I else. I, I thought I'd let everybody else go first. Tim, no, Mike, I just I came out came a little late. I'm sorry, John. How much went to, to lower the tax levy of the of the you know the extra state money? That's all. I, I missed it, and I, I tried to do it on my phone, but I have a small screen. How much went to lower? Went the to, yeah, was it about six hundred thousand went at um, the moment, or three something? How much went to lower the tax rate? No, of the new money? That would be, yeah. From the change that from the, be, that, that would be new money. Yeah, how much of the new money was taken? Right, how much of the new money since the last? Because, because I have the last one. I'm just trying to compare the whole money. It's going to be John. It's going to give you that. Excuse me. 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 Excuse
is about a half a million dollars. Right about five six. That's okay. Yeah, okay. About five That's all. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I knew I had a question. Okay. Hi. Hi. Burns, thank you. I want to thank you again for the locker rooms. Um, I know that you guys just have some... tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You got a shorter today. So I'm very excited. Um, I missed two things. Uh, you guys are talking about $6,600 for this new recycling. recycling program. I think it's a great program. However, I still would like to see some of that $6,600 may be used towards the wellness center that I had asked about and we were waiting for the you need a physical pill education person um, but we have programs set so why can't we use some of those monies so the children can use that wellness center at the high school I know that you were looking for somebody but I yeah, yeah I don't know it's, if it's, it's in a budget not, cost it's not a budget money issue we have you know, the money in, in the high school intramural budget it's a matter of getting staff to do it so isn't there any way that we can negotiate like the PE teachers if they all worked like once a week for eight weeks like almost like a standby program you know what I mean like part of their their physical education teacher I, I don't know it's why I'm asking you okay Sorry. and just one other quick question I miss the meaning about the half circle at the high school the proposal at half circle for the buses the bus loop the bus loop you mean under the bond yes what is that what is what is the proposed amount for that to, to install to the construction of that. Right. John, can you? I would have to. I don't recall. I'm just wondering, we really, as an necessity, as a stable, you know, as a stable graduate, do we really yeah, need to spend that kind of money? Good job, I'm not to get back to you. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm just really questioning the necessity for it. You know. Well, it was one hundred ninety thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. And it's a health and safety issue to try and improve the situation at the high school. So I went to last year's student was also built in front of the high school because of congestion. And to me, it kind of makes sense to separate the two areas because we all know the way some parents go ahead and say, like, it's not going to But is that going to offset any parking for parents picking up right now? So when you pull up in front of the high school, is that is that still going to be there? Now, I'm not sure where you're proposing to put that half bus loop. Is it right in the school? This is going to go. This is going to go right off of Brook Avenue, a large grassy area. That the kids utilize right now for free time. In front of the auditorium. Okay, but you understand that? That's the only spot that the kids can go. When we were in school, we were allowed to go in the back by the hand courts. We were allowed to do things. With a non-open campus, the kids go out and they hang out a little bit. You know, it's a, you need a little bit of they, even after school. I'm, not, I'm just saying it's an area that the kids use. But when I was in school, the other entrances were open. You have enough security staff. Why can't you open the entrance by the science or open the main campus um, now and try to eliminate everybody going into the circle because people would use Cherry Avenue as a drop-off. You'd probably the circle off of work in it. No, no, I'm just, I'm just saying as a drop-off, instead of everybody going to the main entrance, we do have enough security staff to open the main doors or open the... I live on Cherry Avenue. I would come in and go right to the side door. It was open. So... Maybe if you can have everybody going into one area and open some of the other, it could save the district one hundred and ninety thousand dollars for. Well, I'm confident that you know the two administrations, the high school and the central administration, that they're trying to help the safety plan. You know, as far as uh, dealing with you know entering the building. So uh, that's why, I mean, to me, this seems like a a, a logical next step. No, but we've done that in other areas too that we had to control the way traffic flows around the school. I think you should start small before we spend some money. If you at least try it, at least you can say, hey, we tried this without. Well, I, I think I've tried a lot of things in high school. Because I've seen, I, my sons have gone through that school and I've seen different steps. Children in Antonia, as a high school graduate, I've seen a lot of things coming out. So I'm just, as a cost savings to the district and to taxpayers, that's why I was asking again, side entrance. Try that. Parents can pull down Cherry Avenue. You have a crossing guard right there to cross them. Let them go in a side entrance. I, I'm just proposing some other ideas. I appreciate thank the input. Okay, but thank, thank you. And your comments, thank, thank you. you. Now, again, I thought I saw a question in the, in the back row someplace, but if not, <coughs> go to the front row. Blue, huh? Blue has a question. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Good evening. This is Bredouin, Dr. Schreiner, members of the board. Uh, my name is Karen Mockabine, and I uh, <coughs> want to thank you for the opportunity to come and say a few words on behalf of the parents of all the Kensing students here. Um, my son Aiden, the one with crazy hair, he's in sixth grade. Sorry, his name is Aiden. Hi, Aiden. 
that. <laughs> He's a quirky, happy-go-lucky kid. He loves to play chess. He loves to read. And as Dr. Shartner has told me, he definitely thinks outside the box. Um, but he's also a kid that has never really managed to find his niche in school sports. And we have tried. We have tried baseball. We have tried soccer. And we've tried football. And he never complains. He goes to practice for everyone. But he is not one of those kids that you see just carrying some crosses everywhere he goes in the baseball mitts so we can have a catch. He just didn't catch up. He also has ADHD, which has proven to be frustrating for his coaches at times teachers many times, his parents, his fellow teammates. I mean, you look at him, he's looking out the window, he's looking to people to left you, he's checking out what color socks he wore on any given day, and you have no idea he's actually paying attention to you. So as a former collegiate fencer myself, although not a very good one, and a competitive volleyball player, it really hurt me a little bit that my son might never have that experience the bonding, the camaraderie, of being part of the team, the friendships that you make from getting in the sport. And then um, one day I got a call from Coach Anthony, and he said he'd done a demonstration at the school, and Aiden had signed up. He was interested. He wanted defense. And I thought to myself, oh, I wonder how that's going to work out. He likes to make people happy. Is he just trying to please his mother? Because she was a fencer. But we took him to practice. And he wanted to go to practice every single time. Even after the practice, where they did so much conditioning that some of the kids threw up, they <laughs> <laughs> still wanted to go back. <laughs> they didn't throw up at anybody, no. <laughs> and then I took him to open fence. And he put on all of his equipment. He put on his helmet. He put on his lame. He stepped out on the strip. He had no idea what he was doing. <coughs> he fenced anyway. And he walked over and he said, Mom, I guess what I'm doing next Tuesday. He could not wait to get back there and do it again. So I watched him. I watched him practice. I watched him fencing. I watched him scrimmage, scrimmages. And what I saw were coaches who were just as excited to teach these children as the children were to learn. I saw kids of all ages, some of them a little quirky, just like my Aiden, the chess players, the ones who were really into lacrosse. And all of them were more than willing to support each other. They cheered each other on. They helped each other with equipment. Kids who had experience helped the kids who didn't know anything. <coughs> and what I saw happen was I saw a team come together. It was a team that embraced my son. They embraced each other. And they helped inspire a passion, not only in my son, but in so many of these kids. One who have sat here through the meeting without a word of complaint because they want you to know how much they love fencing. So to Dr. Shartner, to the board, to Ms. Maloney, to our amazing coaches, Coach Anthony and Coach Robert. I just wanted to say on behalf of myself and the other parents, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for letting them try something new, something that's not run of the mill, that's a little bit different. And if you ever wonder if you're making a difference with these kids, I have to tell you, you are. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any more comments on, on the budget? Can you be kind of the step up to the podium? Oh, we got a couple. Come on up, guys. They're making you do it this time. Anyone else wants to jump? They can. Come on, you guys can get some stamp on this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for letting us have this sport, letting us play it, and letting us use the old gym, the old junior high gym. And everyone is kind of like a family, a fencer. We all got together, we all practiced, we all had fun together, and we all had fun all day. And, and we learned a lot about fitness, got a good position, condition and we had so much fun. And it gave some people us it gave me a sport in the window when it was like all snowy out and we couldn't play anything. And I would like to thank the coaches for making this all possible, teaching us the sports and making it a good time. Thank you.
Rebecca Kearns. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. And as an 11th grader, next year I'll be starting to apply for colleges. And I've already started visiting colleges. And once they heard that I did fencing, their ears perked up. And Sacred Heart University is uh, talking about me. And uh, letting me do fencing makes me more it, look, it makes me look better for colleges, and I could also get some really good scholarship money for it. So, also, it's always been something I've wanted to do, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to do Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Isabel Byrne, and I would just like to thank you for allowing us to have the Fencing Club this winter. Fencing means, fencing means a lot to me, as this is the only sport I'm able to participate in. I had a lot of fun experience. I had an amazing experience this winter at the Seattle Fencing Club, and I hope to continue to be a part of the team. Thank you. Hello, I'm Meryl Elizabeth Wissman. I'm a sophomore, and I'm the girls' captain for the Seattle Fencing Club. I want to thank you for giving us the club this year, and for giving us the opportunity and giving us the use of the gym. We've had amazing coaches and they've taught us a lot in a very short amount of time. We, most of the team has already won bouts against people who have been fencing for years, people who are on varsity teams at their own schools. And I can't imagine how far they could go given more time. We've all gotten new friends on the team We've learned or enhanced our own teamwork, had a great way to keep in shape over the winter. Personally, as captain, I have had a chance to improve my leadership skills, and I could not be more proud of my team, and I'd like to thank you for giving us this opportunity. I just would like to say something. Well, don't, go, don't, don't sit down, Dad. We're gonna... <laughs> Uh, I just want to say that I am very happy so that you are getting the fencing team. I always, I love fencing. But besides that, your parents have to be very proud of you. Most people, adults, have a hard time standing yes. up in front of a whole community. And you children spoke very eloquently and you did a great job. <laughs> Your camaraderie and your teamwork and your captain speaking so highly of you and you guys, you guys give us the purpose of what we do and this is why we do it. And, uh, you're setting a tremendous example for this community <coughs> and your schools. And I, I have to commend you on it because to get up in public and speak in front of adults is sometimes very difficult. But to speak so highly of each other, uh, I just want to come out and hug each and every one. You guys, you guys are great and it, you, 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 sit, you serve Sable well and you make me say to you. I'm proud that you actually say you are students and you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> you, made, you made my day. <laughs> okay, well, you, you, you gotta, now you got to stick around and listen to the adults a little bit more, but have a seat and we're going to talk a little bit more. All right, next item on our agenda tonight is. Um, any other items on the human aid budget? I'm sorry. We have board discussion. So a couple items for board discussion. Well, we can have a budget as it is. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we already did. Oh, I thought we did too. I thought we already accepted the budget as it is. I told you how I felt, but I listened. Okay, good. Are we going around the room? Are you okay with the budget as it is? Yes. Yeah. Debbie? Just with that recycling program. Just with that uh, Yes. And I am as well. I shared my sentiments with the Now vote for the budget. Now, now, April 22nd, the board will officially adopt it. Uh, we're going to go right to uh, board discussion. <coughs> With the exception of the, I guess, the budget and the recycling program, which I think called already uh, spoke, spoke to, uh, uh, transit solution. Uh, okay. Okay. We're going down to value drug fundraising. Uh, Mr. Cola. That would be 
Yes, uh, Mr. Stroud, are you in the audience? I was approached by Mr. Stroud uh, a few weeks back about possibly, um, you can step up, Mr. Stroud, about um, he's managing the new value drugs around the corner and he has some ideas that could offer some uh, cost savings or fundraising actually for the district. <coughs> so I thought it might be a good idea for us to just listen to see what he has to say and see if we want to go forward with anything. Thank you. Well, thank you. My name is Bill Stroud. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, we do this program in a lot of the districts throughout the state. Okay, uh, coming into the community is something that I want to approach you guys with. It's usually run through a PTA program in the district. What we do is we take the school list that you guys provide to all of the students and we kind of coherently put them together okay and then sell them back to the PTA and the PTA does it as a fundraiser so they can do it where they can raise anything from two or three dollars packet all right and it becomes something that they do for the community and at the same time they raise some money for it. we also do another program where we give them a little key tag they get out they hand it out to all the PTA residents and every time somebody comes in and uses the key tag we will refund back three percent of the purchases to the PTA so it's just community driven. We want to embrace the community as we enter it. So it's just something that I wanted to propose. If there's any questions. I have a recommendation. I have a recommendation. Okay. Um, the, the best vehicle for for you to put this out would be to go to council PTA meeting. Okay. So you can look up when that is on the calendar. It's on our website. No problem. It's the calendar. Usually, I think the third Monday every other month. So maybe it's probably the next one. <coughs> and you'll have all four PTAs, five, five and seven there to be able to address. Eighteen for May. Eighteen. I can get up on the website. I have no problem that I can do that. You know, traditionally in the younger grades is when it's more apt for them. Yeah. Okay, once you start getting into middle school, especially high school, all the kids want to use their own programs and they want to use their own ideas so you know I would gear more towards the younger grades so I have no problem trying to get to the PTAs you know if there's anybody here who has any insight or questions about I think it. Will, uh, what is it, the PTA yeah I know it can't go through us but I think that's very very <coughs> yeah I mean I can do it for every PTA or I can do it for everybody in the district whichever you could probably reach out as well as the individual PTA as well. Yeah. Sunrise Drive, Cherry Avenue. Uh, yeah. They're all represented there. So that would be, mm -hmm. That's all I want to get Yes. Can you, if you can leave me your contact information? Yeah, of course. The district clerk. No problem. I can leave it all for you and then. Yes, and I'll, uh, yeah, I'll get the information for you. To each sure. person. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. And we had transit solutions. Yeah, a few years back when. Uh, I was going for my green certification, which is a, a, a green, it's through the U.S. Green Building Council. I was at a, a Long Island chapter meeting, and I had the pleasure of watching uh, the woman that manages the Transit Solution nonprofit talk about the programs they offer to municipalities, business organizations, and basically they're funded through a grant from the EPA because of Long Island air quality is arguably the worst in the Northeast because of the prevailing wind patterns, um, the chemical reactions that happen in particulate matter and ozone. When the wind blows from the Southwest, basically all the particulate matter in the ozone from the city and New <coughs> Jersey actually blows out some of it from the Midwest and sits over Suffolk County in particular. Um, so that's how they're funded. And basically what they do is they package um, incentive programs for employees to use public transportation or to, to uh, cargo. Um, they do it at no cost to the organization. Um, they do offer um, a pre-tax deduction for employees if they wanted to partake to pay for mass transit. Um, they actually built out, she sent me a flyer where because of Sable's location with the train station and where the, the buses run, Sable's actually a, a, a relatively, even though it's not a transportation hub, it's a good location um, for the program. They also offer, uh, through their website, uh, parents can register and they can actually see real-time carpooling information. So if parents need to go across town and they're looking for a carpool, they can actually see who's in the carpool and they can actually get rides through there. 
Um, they expressed interest in coming to speak at the May 7th meeting and with John and the board's blessing. Um, if you wouldn't mind offering an opportunity just to hear what they have to say, I think, uh, I think it could be something very unique for the district. When I spoke to her, I said, you know, I asked her if she's in schools, and she said, surprisingly, no. We work with a lot of universities, um, but they haven't been able to work with schools, and, and again, they appreciate the opportunity. You'd like to be on the board's discussion call? Yeah. Okay. No objection to the board members? Yeah, members. Okay. Yeah. Right. We'll move right on to the base after meeting call. Okay. Any other items for board discussion? Okay, we're going to move right through this. Uh, we have nothing on the recommended action finance, uh, new business personnel. We do have new business other, 9 1 and 9 2. I need a motion, please. Motion. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried. Uh, uh, I need a motion to adjourn the executive session. Motion. 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 Yeah, I need a motion to go to the executive session to discuss the motion now. Yeah, second. Yeah, we're getting ready. Yeah, we're getting ready. Suggest the board, please. Suggest the board, please.